So without further ado, our first speaker of the night, our brave soul, Aaron, Dr. Aaron Moose. Thank you. It's like a race. It's a good thing I can talk fast. Are you ready? I'm ready. The chytrid fungi are generally benign. Of course, they're really important in decomposing decaying organisms. We would be knee deep in dead things if it weren't for chytrids. But of course, as usual, there's always some bad boys in the group. There's two of them that can attack and kill a vertebrate host. Well, what's a fungus? OK, a fungus is one of the three major kingdoms in the eukaryotes. A eukaryote, among other things, has DNA that's wrapped up in little chromosomes. A major difference of these three is animals engulf their food, plants photosynthesize, and fungi absorb. Fungi may be more closely related to you than you'd like to think. They diverge from animals nine million years after they diverge from plants. Maybe that's why athlete's foot is so hard to keep track of, and maybe that's why there's chytrids that will kill amphibians. In fact, the amphibian chytrid fungus, BD for short, has had major impacts from California to Australia to Colorado. This map's not even right. India has BD too, and in fact, the recent data says that the ancestral home of BD is in India. So ab above the, you know, the horror of athlete's foot, this fungus actually kills individual frogs. Not only that, but in Colorado, populations of BD have declined in northern Colorado as well as in central Colorado. Now, well, how does it actually work? OK, they have, these chytrids have a flagellated zoospore. That means they have little tails. They swim through the water looking for their favorite food, which is keratin, which frogs have a lot of. They burrow into its skin, and then they build this cool structure called a zoosporangium. That builds more zoospores. And when it's full of them, the lid pops off, and they emerge into the water to find more food or more frogs. Well then, how do you think that looks for the frog? Not real good. BD is the causes the disease called chytridiomycosis. Now, this is something that actually thickens the skin. We know the zoospores burrow in. You can imagine how it makes it thick. If you remember high school biology, you know that frogs breathe through their skin. If the skin gets too thick, they can't osmoregulate, they can't maintain their salt balances, they have heart attacks, and they die. It's not good for the frogs. Here's a picture of the little zoosporangium busily thickening the skin. Well, you might want to combat it. We can dry out the entire ecosystem because that kills the fungus, or we can treat every single frog with athlete's foot powder. Of course, that's not very, con not very helpful. We've tried putting probiotic ointment on these frogs in the wild. Helps for a short period of time. Similarly, in Spain, they've dried out whole rock pools, taken the frogs inside, put athlete's foot powder on them, and put them back. Works great for a short time. Maybe we should think more long term. Maybe we can just help the frogs persist on the environment so they can develop their own defenses. And look, that's what's happening in South America. There's some evidence that frogs are actually coming back to places where there were no frogs before, even though the chytrid is still there, it's still lethal, it's still pathogenic. And in fact, in Colorado, the same thing's happening. Oh yeah, there's another one, Batrachochytrium salamander vorans. That means eater of salamanders. This was first discovered in fire salamanders in Europe. They're popular, they give live birth, they live 14 years, they're pretty cool. But this nasty fungus actually eats away the skin. It causes ulcerations rather than thickening the skin. So you can imagine you don't really want to be a salamander when that's going on. It apparently comes from Asia via the pet trade. Hold that thought. This is a movie. Look, look, he's suffering from B. Sal. Poor little thing. These, the first ones to die were a population in the Netherlands. It was a small population of fire salamanders. B. Sal attacks many different species, but especially small populations. A real problem if you're someplace like Sardinia, which has five different salamander species that all have home ranges or ranges, entire ranges, of under 500 square kilometers. This is not where you want to be. Small populations, but it's in Europe. It's a long way away, but it came from Asia via the pet trade. Look how many amphibians we import. What do you think the odds are? It doesn't look good, does it? Well then, don't buy salamanders. But look at why would we care? We would care because the US, the eastern US, is the salamander epicenter of biodiversity. Oh. 
in the world. So that is a big deal. We don't really want to get this. Herpetologists are really concerned. If B-cell gets to the US, it's going to be bad. So what we're doing, we're doing something fairly innovative. For the fungus, the Fish and Wildlife Service has declared that 201 species of salamanders are illegal to be imported into the United States because they might carry this devastating fungus. But keep in mind, chytrid fungi are good. Do you want to be walking around in carcasses? No. There's just a couple that are really bad. Some populations may be recovering. B cell's not here yet. But don't go buying a bunch of amphibians and don't turn them loose if you get them. Wow. So that's Ignite Night in a nutshell right there. Just fast-paced chaos. Um, our next speaker uh, is Dr. Ian Pierce, and he is a research ecologist with USGS as well. I'm assuming you two work closely or near each other at some point? Across the building from each other. Oh, <laughs> a first time for everything here at Biodiversity Ignite Night. Um, and he's with the Fort Collins Science Center as well, and he is speaking tonight um, on Plants Are Not Still Life. All right, so thank you for having me here. Plants are not still life. In fact, they might even have behaviors that we're interested in. So I'm gonna show you two pictures here that are very similar, and I want you to tell me what the differences are between them. Okay, we have two pictures here. You'll notice a lot of similarities. There's a similar color scheme, there's vases. They're both still lives, right? More, you know, better observers will note, all these organisms are dead. But maybe some of you noticed the subtle difference that one is people and the other is plants. Now, one elicits a very different response from the other, and that's really because plants are aliens to us. We have no feelings for them. We have very little sense of how they work. In fact, aliens are more similar to us than plants are, because when we draw an alien, we draw something a lot like us, right? It's not to say that plants are unimportant or uninteresting to us. We care about them a lot. Uh, they're the foundation of a lot of what we do, a foundation of ecosystems, of biodiversity. <laughs> and it's very important to understand uh, the behaviors that plants have um, because they interact with a lot of organisms. Plants are having conversations with their pollinators, with their herbivores, with the enemies of their herbivores, with other plants and with microbes throughout the environment. And knowing these things can help us make predictions. Plants know when they're being eaten by herbivores and they have chemical responses uh, to, the, uh, to that attack. Many of these responses are extremely specific where a particular herbivore will elicit a particular response in uh, a specific plant. And we can show this elegantly by damaging plants and adding the saliva or regurgitant from different herbivores uh, to that wound. And you, you get a different response from the plant. So many of those responses are chemical in nature. And this plant dictionary, the language that they're speaking, perhaps, is just foreign to us. And uh, understanding that language, understanding the meaning behind S. linalool is something that we're interested in doing. One very well-known behavior of plants is when they're being eaten by herbivores, they release volatile compounds or smells that are thought of as cries for help to the enemies of those herbivores uh, for the plant's advantage. In reality, this is a little ridiculous, though, because there is no such thing as a cry for help. There's just cries that organisms can perceive however they'd like. And those cries are perceived now, we're finding, by other plants, by microbes, by a vast variety of uh, other organisms in the environment. And this is important. Other organisms should listen, as plants are energetically at the center of most food webs and um, are, are very important. One particularly important behavior that plants have is the decision as to when they reproduce, when they make seeds or when they germinate those seeds. And a lot of plants do this in a very concerted way. For example, oaks produce acorns only in particular years. They have a strong boom-bust cycle of uh, masting, people call it. 
uh, where in some years there's a ton of acorns all throughout a big region like California, and in other years there's almost none. So many organisms care about this and rely on this. Uh, populations of mice vary with acorns, and this causes Lyme disease, ticks, and gypsy moth populations to all vary to some degree with acorn crops. Of course, many herbivores like to eat acorns. They're pretty tasty. And uh, the, this is not necessarily good for the plant. So that variation that the plant produces in seed production is probably to its own benefit uh, by reducing the ability of herbivores to track those seeds. The way that oaks seem to do this is by coordinating on temperature cues. So uh, the temperature in April strongly corresponds to acorn crops. And what isn't known, though, really, is um, whether this is truly a behavior, whether the plant says, ah, it's a warm April, I'm going to produce a bunch of acorns, or whether this is a constraint, where on a cold April, perhaps something just gets screwed up about making an acorn crop. So a long time ago, in the 60s, plant ecology was revolutionized by thinking about uh, a Darwinian approach to ecology, thinking about ecology or plant ecology in a new way. Now we're thinking of plant ecology more and more in a behavioral way, where plants are more active than ever before in their environments. This could also be thought of, again, as a Darwinian approach to plant ecology, because Darwin, the great naturalist himself, put forward many books on the subject. And I will thank you. Sir. I see a lot of people standing around. If you can't find a chair, if you go in the back room, there's a whole pile of them. You can grab them one at a time and bring them in and, and have a seat, if you like. You don't have to. Um, all right, how you guys doing? Biodiversity has been said a few times. Um, just as a reminder, the other words are conservation, climate change, invasive species, and habitat loss. So hopefully someone uses nothing but those words in their talk tonight. Um, our next speaker is Dr. Arathi Shashadri. Um, she's a faculty member in the Department of Soil and C Crop Sciences and also an executive committee member of the Global Biodiversity Center. So she's a little more invested than the average speaker. So I will turn it over to her and her talk titled City Bees and Country Bees. Okay. Thank you. Um, okay. Ready? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Thanks for having me. So I will be talking a little about city bees and country bees, specifically urban beekeeping and some of the urban efforts to conserve bees and also what's going on in our natural environment. Um, honeybees that are most commonly uh, seen in urban areas because of uh, urban beekeeping are cavity nesting bees. They, have, they live in large colonies, they are managed for honey production, and they're also extremely important for our pollination services. Here in North America, this is the most commonly seen species of uh, honeybees that you will see. These colonies are really large. Um, they collect a lot of nectar and pollen. Close to about 60 kilograms of uh, uh, honey a year is about what they make. Um, the p pollen is the protein source for the larva, and that, that's what they're collecting throughout the growing season. Uh, these colonies are really huge. They're about 20,000 to 30,000 bees. There's a single queen, and all she needs to do is lay eggs, and she has this huge bunch of worker force to take care and do all the work for her. And those worker bees will do different tasks throughout their lifetime uh, and take care of the young and bring forth all of these different bees. So they have become extremely co common now in the urban areas. The cityscapes are becoming very, uh, what do you say, conducive for beekeeping. Um, as you can see, the roof rooftop garden and apiary in the Astoria Hotel in New York City. Um, these urban beekeeping ventures come with a little bit of a challenge. We have to be responsible about it because these bees have a lot of diseases and pests that when poorly managed could spread. And spread around to not just other honeybee colonies, but also to other bees that uh, are foraging in the flowers. So those are the native bees. Flowers are really good locations for these pathogen transfer. And we do have incidences where honeybees have spread pests and diseases to bumblebees and some of the other native bees. Now you're asking me what are native bees? And this is what I call as country bees in this talk. They're mostly solitary. About 70% of them are ground nesting, and this is something that you might not even pay notice to. Uh, they're all in the unmulched areas of your uh, backyard, and about 30% of them are stem nesting. 
What is a life cycle like? That's a little familiar. It's like a life of a single mom, where the female goes around, collects pollen, gathers all the pollen and nectar, builds the nest, feeds the young, seals off the cell. This is what she does in a month of her lifetime. That's uh, usually what happens. You'll see a lot of these in your backyard. Many of these very colorful, pretty looking bees are these single moms that are going around building these nests and uh, caring for their young. So we could help them. But we also keep hearing about the kinds of problems that the bees are facing. And this brings me to this poem by Emily Dickinson that says, to make a prairie, it takes a clover and one bee. One clover and a bee and reverie. What is scary for me is the last sentence, that reverie alone will do if bees are few. What's happening? This is what is happening with all of, to all of these bees. A lot of urbanization, huge increased demand for pollination. And then come these monocultures with all of these large single acre or single uh, genotypes of crops that are taking over our ecosystem. What can we do? We can help by increasing some of the pollinator friendly plants in your backyard. Pick those small, plant, small flowers, they are rich in pollen and nectar. These showy flowers really don't have anything for those pollinators. So this is something that all of us can do in our backyard. But what about our e uh, agroecosystems? That's a canola field in bloom in, for about one to two weeks. And this is what happens three to four weeks later. What can we do? We tried a little bit of an experiment where we planted a pollinator habitat around these fields, uh, picking plants that would bloom before and after canola is blooming, and provide a continuous source of nutrition for the bees that would be in that area. And what we found was that um, there, is a lot, there are a lot of bee overlaps between the habitat and the canola fields. And as, as it said, if you build it, they will come. There were a lot of bees overlapping in all, both of these habitats. In fact, we found some three genera that were unique to just the habitat. So this actually tells you that a little bit of area given to the bees will help. Invasive species, there it is. So we can control invasive species and help bring back some of the uh, flowering pl plants. This is something we just started on last year, where we're control looking at the effect of controlling cheatgrass. And what we are seeing is the recurrence of a lot of these different flowering plants, the tradescantias, the penstemons, and a lot of these were seen within three to four months of uh, controlling cheatgrass. And as we were observing them, what we saw was also the coming of all the bees and the butterflies into these areas. And uh, we saw the hairy belly bee, and also the bombus, and a lot of different butterflies. The native flora depend on these bees and butterflies for pollination. So when we are thinking about pollination and you're eating your apples and almonds, also think about all of these native flora. They're really important. And so healthy populations of all of these bees are really critical, not just for our food crops, but also for our native vegetation. Um, and so we need to kind of take care of the entire ecosystem. Thank you. That's great. All right, moving right along, our next speaker is Teresa Laverty. She is a PhD candidate in fish, I don't know why I'm looking at my notes, I know you, <laughs> fish, wildlife, and conservation biology department. Um, she will be speaking today on From John Wesley Powell to African Deserts, Water, Bats, and Biodiversity. There you go. <laughs> yeah. Hi everyone, thank you for coming. Um, I'm excited to talk to you today about a chapter of my PhD work that I'm currently working on. So you may have heard of John Wesley Powell. He was the second director of the US Geological Survey. And he was um, one of the first people to really strongly note the lack of water that we have here in the Western US. Um, and water is a big issue worldwide. Less than 4% of all the water that we have on Earth is found as fresh water. And that's what you're seeing right here. And most of our fresh water is locked up as ice and glaciers. And water is not distributed equally across the world, as you might imagine. Areas that are extremely water limited include desert systems. I work in the Namib Desert in Southern Africa along the coast of Namibia. It's considered to be one of the world's oldest deserts. And for that reason, has a lot of cool biodiversity. Rivers in desert systems tend to look something like this. 
where water is flowing underground most of the year, and you're lucky if it sustains above ground flows for a handful of days each year. The more permanent farms of water are found as natural springs and artificial pools constructed either for wildlife or livestock in these systems. And these water bodies, especially in desert systems, are true biodiversity hotspots. They really function to cluster all these animals, particularly during the dry parts of the year. However, water bodies can really vary in their chemistry when you compare one to another. And for that reason, you might be interested in finding indicator species like bats um, to be used for water quality. There are over 1,300 species of bats recognized worldwide, and this makes up about a quarter of all mammal diversity. And so if you're interested in finding indicator species, bats are really good species to use. In deserts, one of the first things that bats tend to do is come down and take a drink um, at the early stages of the night. And so these guys um, can tell us quite a bit about the water. To look at water quality, um, I was examining about 30 water holes um, in the northern Namib and collected samples to be sent in for a lab for analysis. And one of the first questions that I asked is whether there are any seasonal differences in water quality between the dry and the wet seasons, which you can see during good wet years have very big changes. However, I didn't really find any significant changes um, within a site uh, for seasonal differences. I then asked whether water quality varies between sites, and it does. So right here, we're just looking at fluoride. Um, having fluoride is good for your teeth, but having too much is bad. And all I want you to take away is that there are differences between different sites here, and that some of these sites are even uh, above the concentrations that are uh, listed as the higher level that livestock should consume. And so these would be very unsafe for human consumption and for other species as well. So I then asked how do bats relate to water quality in these systems? And I did this by looking here at MISNET data um, in addition to acoustic data. Um, these were set up right over water holes. And so what you're seeing here are the two most abundant species that had distributional differences in my system. And what I found is that water body type um, seems to be a better indicator for this angle and wing gland bat up here, um, the numbers that we would capture at a site, while water quality features like the concentration of potassium or calcium were much better predictors of the number of long-tailed serentines we have here in the bottom. And so perhaps looking at species like the long-tailed serentine would be a good way to start at looking at water quality indicators. Um, these bats move around quite a bit, unlike your typical aquatic indicators. Um, and so in desert systems, these guys might be great. So why do we care? Um, this area is primarily pastoralist communities that keep livestock. And it's a biodiversity hotspot where it gets a lot of ecotourism. And it's not uncommon for people, livestock, and animals to be sharing the exact same water holes. So having cheap um, and readily available indicators of water quality could be beneficial for finding areas that are safe for human consumption, but also conservation hotspots to conserve. Um, and I hope you can go away today knowing that not all water is the same and that water quality matters just as much as quantity in these systems and that bats may be useful as indicators of water quality in deserts. <laughs> well done. You guys can finish your thoughts after the slides and if you want. <laughs> Okay, um, we are in the swing of things now. Sticking in the same department, we have Dr. Kate Hyvert, uh, a faculty member, Fish, Wildlife, Conservation, Biology. <laughs> Woo, Kate! Uh, and she will be speaking today on, <laughs> she's anxious to get up here, um, not such a bird-brained idea, seabirds, diversity, and marine system health. Thanks, Jacob. Thanks, everyone. All right, we'll see if we get the timing right on this. <laughs> and you're off. 
Okay, thanks everyone for being here. Thanks for um, you know putting up with this. So the bird-brained idea that I'd like to propose to you is that albatrosses, a type of seabird, can tell us a lot about marine ecosystem health. So what, see what you think about this idea. Starting out with a, a quote from the all-time biggest poem about albatrosses, water, water everywhere and all the boards did shrink. Water, water everywhere, nor any drop to drink. So Coleridge is telling us, stay hydrated. We should have that as a word. In, this, in these oceans, we see about 480 species of bird above the oceans and hundreds of thousands of species within the oceans, up to two million species. So biodiversity <laughs> is a big deal in the ocean. But the news isn't that great, and that's that between 1970 and now, we've lost about 39% of the species of wildlife. 10% of all critically endangered birds? Yeah, those are seabirds, and so they're connected to water. Why is that? Because we do nasty things to the water. We catch albatrosses in long lines. Um, we introduce invasive species. <laughs> we pollute. We contribute to climate change. That was on there, too. <laughs> And what does that do? That leads to marine ecosystem change. So if we kill seabirds, bad things happen. How can we test that hypothesis and those predictions? So let's have a look. We can use seabirds as sentinels. So seabirds are top predators. They eat at the very top of the food chain. They cover thousands of miles of ocean. And they cross that air-water interface. So they feed in the water, and they fly in the air. Let me introduce you to this fellow. This is the waved albatross. It's the only tropical albatross in the world. It occurs on Espanola, the southeasternmost island of the Galapagos Archipelago, a group of islands that straddles the equator in Ecuador. And it's another endangered albatross. 19 of 22 albatross species are endangered. In this case, breeding pair numbers are going way down. Adult survival is going way down. So what the heck is going on? <laughs> we think that declines are linked to interactions with fisheries. So on the far left panel, you see these gray blobs and white dots. The gray blobs are fishers. The white dots are albatrosses. So albatrosses and fishing go together. And we see that interactions are direct and severe. On the far left, that's an albatross that got caught but, but escaped. In the middle, not so good. On the far right, an example of a bird that had been um, that took a hook that somebody had tried to, to hook it with. This is not an albatross. This is a blue-footed booby. <laughs> these guys are icons of Galapagos, but the news isn't very good for these guys either. In the 1960s, <laughs> we saw about 20,000, I shouldn't say we, they saw about 20,000 blue-footed boobies in Galapagos. Between 2012 and 2017, we've looked again, and only about a third of the population is there. And we attribute this to the collapse of Pacific sardine fisheries. We also have a plastics problem. The red spots here indicate places where there's a lot of junk in the oceans. And that junk is plastic. 250,000 tons are floating out there. About 90% of that junk is plastic. Uh, it, it, if you look at some of these neat papers that try to estimate that, that's about 5 trillion pieces of plastic bags, plastic bottles, plastic caps. What does this have to do with the waved albatross? Well, plastic is ingested in the waved albatross. These birds go really far out to sea. They take in a bunch of fish and squid. They come back. They feed their chicks regurgitant. <laughs> And then the chicks are also fed these plastic pieces and die. Disease is an issue, too. This is probably the grossest slide that we're going to see all night. This is Ava pox virus. So this is a pox virus causing these really nasty lesions. And some chicks are losing their bill. This is a fatal disease in these guys. How is this connected to the rest of the ecosystem? Parents come back, they feed their chicks. It could be that the parents have the virus and give the virus to their chicks while they're feeding them. It could be these guys. So those are mockingbirds. What does this have to do with climate change? Temperatures go up, mosquito numbers go up, uh, more virus is transmitted to, to potential hosts, and then fewer albatrosses are present. 
what can we do about all of this? <laughs> one thing that we can do is to collaborate. We can take a One Health approach and call up our friends and say, hey, I've got a monster in my front yard. Can you help me out? The other thing that we can do is to not suck. And so what that said was more mustaches, less straws. Thank you. <laughs> a lot of fun information. Um, how are you guys doing? Everybody good? Anybody need a refill on drinks? On the house? Yeah, not quite. Um, one more talk um, for this first half, and then you guys can get your refill, and then we can get back at it. Um, our last talk of the first half is by Sarah Bambachi. Woo! Woo! Man. Um, she is a PhD candidate in Fish, Wildlife, Conservation, Biology Department, but also with graduate degree program in ecology. Um, and if you all have time on Friday at 3 p.m., head on over to Wagar 133. A little bird told me that she will be giving her exit seminar then, and you can hear a little bit more about what I'm sure she'll touch on today. And that is the Battle for Island Biodiversity, New Zealand at the Front Lines. Thank you, Jacob. And yep. Okay. Thanks for having me here tonight. And um, yeah, so I'm going to be talking to you about the battle for island biodiversity. And I'm going to apologize right now because I have pretty much all of those words in at least I, basically every slide. So it's a good thing we're going to get drinks after this because you're going to be empty. So what do you think about when you hear the word island or how about New Zealand? For many, probably some of these images come to mind. So you probably think epic mountains, beautiful beaches, fantastic scenery. But maybe you don't automatically think biodiversity. But islands are global biodiversity hotspots. They contain 20% of terrestrial plant and animal species in less than 5% of Earth's surface area. And New Zealand is no exception to this pattern. And you may not also know that in New Zealand right now, a very remarkable biodiversity conservation story is playing out. And hopefully I'll convince you by the end of this talk that New Zealand is a place to pay attention to if you want to see large scale conservation in action. You see, New Zealand has lost much of its native biodiversity. And although many factors have contributed to these declines, the main driver are invasive mammals that eat the native animals and degrade their habitats. And this isn't just a New Zealand problem. Uh, invasive species are driving island extinctions worldwide. So half of recent extinctions were island species, and one third of species facing extinction occur on islands. And so to understand what's at stake, just read these words by an uh, early explorer of New Zealand, Joseph Banks, who wrote of New Zealand's original fauna. This morn I was awaked by the singing of the birds ashore. The numbers of them were certainly very great, who seemed to strain their throats. Their voices were the most melodious wild music I've ever heard, the most tunable silver sound imaginable. So that sounds pretty great. Um, but the people of New Zealand take the loss of their biodiversity seriously. And the citizens and government have mounted quite an impressive effort to suppress mammals using trapping and other eradication techniques and help try to give their native wildlife a fighting chance. And they have completely eradicated uh, invasive mammals from s many small islands off of the coast of the, what's called the mainland um, and have seen remarkable population recovery of their native species in the wake of these efforts. And then someone came up with a really interesting idea in the form of fenced mammal-free sanctuaries. So these are areas where a predator-proof fence is erected around a patch of habitat, and mammals are eradicated within, which provides an opportunity to restore the wildlife. And so, because not a lot of work has gone into looking at the effectiveness of these sanctuaries, my research asks whether they are effective at conserving birds. And because birds do important ecosystem work, like eating fruit and dispersing seeds, whether they are also good at restoring seed dispersal. And long story short, they work great. So I found that bird population densities were higher across a whole suite of native species in the sanctuary sites, which are the green bars here, than in the reference sites. And 
Um, also for seed dispersal, so two metrics of seed dispersal foraging rates and dispersed seed densities. A similar pattern, I found higher uh, metrics for these in the sanctuary sites than in the reference sites across a whole suite of different uh, native plant species. And so all of these innovations are leading to conservation solutions uh, for islands under threat from invasive mammals worldwide. So the eradication and trapping technology developing, developed in New Zealand has been used, used elsewhere, and these fences are being uh, put up in Guam and Hawaii and other islands, and that's giving these guys a fighting chance. So species that don't do so well with invasive mammals like Tieki and Takahe and Kakariki are able to hold on until large-scale, long-term solutions can be developed. And New Zealand's got that covered too. So the country has announced plans to make uh, New Zealand predator-free by 2050, so complete eradication of mammals from the country by 2050. I mean, that's pretty impressive. I wish, I would like to just get my PhD done in time. Uh, so they hope to do this through advances in gene drive technology and uh, trapping technology. And so be on the lookout for some really interesting research to emerge on the social, moral, and conservation implications of such an ambitious project. So keep, pay attention to our neighbors in the south. They have continually stepped up their game when it comes to biodiversity conservation and have no qualms about setting large, ambitious goals. And even if they fail to meet those targets, they are still going to make quite a bit of progress for island conservation. And that is a point of optimism, because one day the people of New Zealand may hear the same melodious wild music that Joseph Banks did ring across the country, and that may be replicated globally. And what a fantastic conservation success story that would be. Thank you. Let's give another big round of applause for the first half speakers. Um, so our next presenter, who is going to fight through the train, is Teresa Bosch. And she is, woo, a PhD student. Student? Candidate. Candidate. candidate, PhD candidate in bioagricultural sciences and pest management departments. Um, and she'll be talking on facilitation, a tale of diverse insects and environmental stewardship. Thanks. Uh, biodiversity, invasive species, conservation. <laughs> <clears throat> Okay, so I'm going to talk about some of my dissertation research out of Paul Odie's lab here at CSU. In the Odie lab, we talk about negative interactions a lot. We talk about competition, we talk about parasitism, we talk about herbivory, but today I'm going to talk about facilitation, positive interactions. So to facilitate is to make easy or easier. And here I have pictured some of my cohort, some of the people in the audience here who have made my time here getting my PhD easier. Uh, but in ecological communities, <laughs> Facilitation can be commensalism, neutral positive interactions between organisms, and uh, mutualism, positive positive <laughs> interactions between organisms. And as we have, I'm going too fast, it's too fast. As we have human disturbance, <laughs> we <laughs> get changes in the species presence, present, which can impact those interactions, right? Whether or not species can facilitate one another. So with human, human disturbance, we have the taking away of species, but we also have bringing in lots of species. So we bring in lots of pests and we weeds and pests. And we have to determine which ones are weeds and how to manage them and how intensively to manage them, and it can get really complicated. And we also have to think about our land use goals. So whether it's for recreation or rangelands or agriculture or maybe a wildlife refuge, we have to think about what types of weed management can be uh, the best or the most helpful given our land use goals. One of the ways we do this is with biological control agents. Biological control agents are highly specialized organisms that attack our target weed or our target pest. <laughs> Lots of them are insects that attack our plants. Um, some really good biolog biological control agents are galling insects. Galling insects are highly specialized. They require their particular host plant in order to form a gall. So a gall is bloated plant tissue um, inside of which there are little larvae. See that, that second row there? 
Okay, so the little larva, <laughs> the, the insect needs that in order to have its life cycle, to, get, to develop and to grow and to feed. And it needs that particular tissue, those particular genetics, that, that seasonal timing in order to make that gall. Galling insects are diverse. Biodiversity! Um, we have <laughs> more than 13,000 species of described galling insects, uh, and more being described all the time. In 2014, I got to be on a paper on one of those. Whoop. Oh, there we go. And my study system <laughs> has two biological control agents, two galling insects that attack Russian knapweed. Russian knapweed is a noxious weed found in Colorado. It can really impact agriculture and, and rangelands throughout, you know, in Colorado. Uh, so these insects are really, really small. They're, they're, they're particularly tiny. I'm sure you all know that small things can have a big impact, but uh, these insects can have a big impact on uh, weed management. <laughs> Okay, so my dissertation is about how these three species interact. I ask whether it's better to have two biological control agents or one, um, how the two insects interact with one another. We expected really competitive interactions, so negative interactions between the, between the two insects. And we do these cool field observations. We have 60 field sites across Colorado that I get to visit all the time. And uh, we work with private landowners, public land managers, Colorado Department of Ag, and we go out there and we check it out. We also do these really manipulative greenhouse experiments and field experiments with um, these awesome undergraduate students and other researchers and get to really manipulate where the insects are and how they're interacting with one another. And guess what? We found facilitation, uh, which is exciting because we we're expecting those negative interactions. Uh, but we found positive interactions between these insects, which is exciting uh, for biological control, but it's also exciting for land management and for environmental stewardship. Um, <laughs> as we're deciding where species should and shouldn't be. Okay, so facilitation can promote coexistence, even uh, amongst competitors or species that are using the same resources. Uh, there are some cool models that can show that. Um, and then coexistence at a larger scale can lead to biodiversity. So there we go, biodiversity. Um, and that's exciting for land management and for restoration, and, and we should be thinking about these positive interactions, not just the negative interactions in these uh, ecological communities. Furthermore, not just ecological communities, but human communities, we should be thinking about these positive interactions. So my research is really collaborative, and it's really exciting and awesome in that way. Um, so we should be getting everyone involved in the discussions and the solutions around environmental stewardship and we should be getting positive. Thanks. Thank you. How many of you are, uh, all right, I'll just ask this. How many of you are nerdy enough to like, like tear apart galls as kids? Hands in the air, nice, cool, me too. Um, also, I'm just gonna embarrass myself completely. I've been asked to tell more jokes, so I'm gonna tell the worst joke that I know. Uh, um, two fish are in a tank. One says to the other, I'll drive, you take the guns. All right, our next speaker, you guys are going to laugh eventually. It's just going to be random laughs. There it is. All right, um, our next speaker, <laughs> I don't get it is what all I'm hearing. So this is why I'll never be up here again. Another one. This is the crowd we hope to have, the rowdy crowd. Um, our next speaker is Kim Dolphin. Where, where are you hiding? Oh, she's over here. Uh, woo! Kim. She is a PhD candidate in the biology department, and she will be speaking on opening a black box, the missing link between neurobiology and biodiversity. Yes. Yeah, so as you can tell from my title, take a little different approach to biodiversity. Great, so mostly when we talk about biodiversity, we're talking about an organismal level of things interacting with each other. But biodiversity is greater than skin deep. And specifically, it's also within species. So you have population differences. What I'm interested in is these population differences specifically within the Trinidadian guppy. So these little teleost fish exist in two population forms where you have high predator 
males, or guppies in general, below these waterfall barriers, and they're inundated by these cichlid predators. Conversely, above the waterfall barriers, you have these low predation populations that have established and have virtually removed themselves from most of that predation pressure. With this, they have completely diverged in many different levels, including their alternative mating tactics. So males can either choose to perform a courtship display, which is super flashy and woos all the ladies, and they show off those bright orange colors. Alternatively, they can perform a much less conspicuous sneak mating display. And this varies between populations. So, when an animal performs any behavior, there's three time scales that are going to interact with this. Genetics which interacts with the developmental experiences and the current physiological state. Of course, the genetics is the thumbprint of those previous um, pressures. This only gets more complicated when you ex ha include the decision-making processes. So these poor little males have to decide whether to court a female or s perform a sneak mating behavior. So how do males do this? Well, guppy brains are really small. That is a guppy brain on a penny there. And <laughs> what I've been able to do is, thanks to a fancy deli slicer and a few antibodies, I've been able to show population level differences in these neural activations. So on the left here, you have the brain of a low predation male. That's two different regions. And then on the right, you actually have the same brain regions from a high predation male. And one thing I hope that you guys can see really clearly is that when you actually compare the little freckles there, which are <coughs> the neural, um, recently activated neurons, you can see that the low predation males have much more neural activation. So the other aspect of this is that when you compare these on individual neural regions, this changes. So it's not consistent that low predation always has more activation. So this implies that there could be actually a circuit level difference, which has really strong implications for a lot of different things. <clears throat> Importantly, now that we've opened this black box and shown that decisions aren't made out of the mouth of the guppy, but actually out of the brain of the guppy, current physiological state is also influencing these decisions in hormones. Why do we care about hormones? Because many pollutants actually interfere with these endocrine systems in the form of endocrine disrupting chemicals. So endocrine disrupting chemicals can interfere with hormones through competitive inhibition and a lot of other things that can directly affect the reproduction and courtship of these behaviors. When you start doing this on different levels and that you see these different populations, then you can actually assume that these different populations may be more or less sensitive to these endocrine disrupting chemicals. And we've seen in guppies that these EDCs actually do affect these behaviors that are absolutely critical for their survival. So when you're considering all of these different things, it allows you to ask a lot of different questions, such as how do EDCs interfere with the hormones? How do EDCs even start to interfere with the brain? But most importantly, do populations differ in sensitivity? And this is where understanding this level of biodiversity really comes into play. So when you're comparing the actual population level differences of these neuro systems, you can actually start seeing these patterns that imply that some populations may be at more at a greater risk to EDCs. So what I'm arguing is that understanding the genetic architecture underlying how it changes these different neural constraints can actually inform you about whether or not these physiological states, these hormone systems, these hormone-mediated behaviors are going to be more or less disrupted by these chemical pollutants that are coming into the waterways. Breathe. <laughs> so, we know that these different EDCs affect many different species, and I'm arguing that you guys also need to care about these levels because none of these things interact with EDCs equally. And so understanding the underlying mechanisms that are affecting it will allow us to protect the general organismal level by understanding the mechanisms underlying it. Thank you. By show of hands, as a kid, how many of you tore apart guppy brains and looked at neural connectivity? No one. Okay. Me neither. Um, 
Awesome. Uh, our next speaker is Dr. Ben Gullis, and he is a veterinarian who is currently working on his PhD. He's a PhD candidate um, in the graduate degree program in ecology, and he will be speaking on healthy heterogeneity in host behaviors. All right. Thanks, everybody. So uh, what is the deal with biodiversity? <laughs> Um, so, I'm Ben. I'm going to talk to you about uh, different hosts uh, and their uh, different behaviors can change their response to infectious diseases in a way that helps conserve biodiversity. So, infectious diseases are something that have affected a lot of animals across the globe. Emerging infectious diseases are increasing in both humans and wildlife and causing vast decreases in numbers of a lot of our most charismatic fauna. And fungal diseases in particular have been a major problem lately. So we have chytrid fungus causing death in amphibians. We have white nose syndrome fungus killing bats. We have snake fungal disease, which is pretty self-explanatory. And uh, the, these fungal diseases tend to be very generalist, uh, opportunistic fungi. They can affect many different species. The white nose syndrome fungus uh, causes disease in at least nine different bat species that we know of, two of which are endangered, one is threatened. And it has diverse lineages across Europe and Asia, and like many invasive species, was probably introduced to North America through human activities, globalization, um, things like cavers traveling across the globe. And it was introduced in a single cave in New York. York State and has since spread across the entire eastern U.S. and Canada in the past decade and has gone as far as Washington State and is as close now as Kansas, recent devel developments. So the fungus, Pseudogymnoascus destructans, it grows in cold temperatures, high humidity microclimates, um, and when bats go into hibernation, they lower their body metabolism, they go into torpor, lower their body temperature, which makes them basically the perfect incubators for for this fungus, and despite the name white nose syndrome, it'll grow on any skin surface, so wings, ears, and those fungal lesions disrupt this large surface area leading to loss of heat, energy, and water resources. And as a result of this fungus, the bats will arouse from their torpor much more frequently. As they wake up more frequently, they just use these huge excessive amounts of energy that lead to starvation and subsequently mortality. So um, despite near 100% mortality in some populations, we still see remnant populations of bats that are badly hit by the disease. And we see some some species that aren't affected at all. And the question is, can behavioral differences between these bats describe that? And energetics models say, yes, the big brown bat, not badly hit by the species, has these large, wide ranges of temperature and humidity that it can cohabitate with the fungus and still have enough energy to survive the winter. Compare that to the little brown bat, not so great. They have just a very narrow range in which they can survive because their physiological needs in hybrid nation match up very closely with the fungus. So, uh, can we, we can describe this on a continental scale between species. We can say some die, some don't, but what about those remnant populations of little brown bats? Uh, can we determine whether they are using that very narrow range of microclimates? So to get at this question, we're setting up data loggers, temperature humidity data loggers in caves and mines to measure the microclimates that they may be using to hibernate. And we measure that microclimate and we can tell uh, whether these bats are surviving or whether they're using ecological traps, areas where before fungus introduction, it might be really nice, attractive habitat, and after fungal introduction, it is a dead zone for them. So uh, the problem with this approach is that bats can fly, turns out, and they can move around in the middle of hibernation. And in that movement, our stationary data loggers are not capturing the full range of their microclimate choices. But we realized when we were waterproofing our data loggers that we can actually make them small enough to put onto the bats themselves. So we can put these data loggers on the bats, and doing that, we can record throughout winter that individual bats' entire 
entire range of microclimate choices throughout hibernation, as well as the beginning and end of hibernation, the frequency of arousals. We can take all of this information and feed it back into those energetics models, which will tell us whether this bat chose a microclimate that predisposed it for survival of this disease. And using this type of information, we can identify populations that are at risk for extirpation, and we can funnel management resources towards bats that are in need of help. So uh, doo -doo -doo. Uh, to wrap up, <laughs> um, we, we, this is an ongoing project. Uh, there's still a lot yet to do, but we hope that through our efforts, we'll be able to take that first step to help conserve bat biodiversity by understanding this problem better. All right, we are down to our last three talks of the night. Our next talk is Dr. Cindy Brown, who is faculty member in bioagricultural sciences and pest management. She's also an executive committee member with the Global Biodiversity Center, so she plays a hand in organizing events like these. Um, and her talk tonight is titled Wildflower or Weed? What's the difference? Thank you. It's great to be here. And thanks for coming. Um, nice. Uh, template for your slides there, Ben. <laughs> You'll see, mine are, mine's the same, so. Um, yeah. <laughs> All right. Sometimes it's difficult to tell whether a plant is a wildflower or a weed. It's something, is it something that occurs naturally or a plant growing out of place, somewhere where we don't want it to? We might ask ourselves, does it really matter? What's the difference? So what is the difference? A species growing where, um, or species growing where they naturally occur typically do so in combination with others, sometimes more, sometimes fewer, depending on the ecological system and when it was last disturbed, like this assemblage of pretty native plants growing after a wildflower fire, <laughs> after a wildfire. But what happens when species are moved from where they naturally occur to new locations? Research shows that most species behave pretty much the same way uh, they do, they did back home. If they were well behaved at home, they're also well behaved away. Yet some species become disproportionately successful in a new location. And they may outcompete other species and form monocultures like this yellow star thistle. So why do invasions like this happen? This is something scientists and land managers have been grappling with for a long time. And ultimately, there's just one answer. It's us. Humans do a lot of things to make plant invasions possible. First, we intentionally introduce them. 75% of the non-native species that become established outside of cultivation and sustain persistent populations are grown in home gardens, and at least 95% of these species are grown in botanical gardens. These non-native species grown in gardens are more widespread than non-natives that are not cultivated. So this species of daylily reproduces vegetatively with underground stems, which gives it the ability to spread quickly, outcompete natives, and become invasive, while its clump-forming relatives are not invasive. We also introduce invasive species accidentally. Some are moved to new places as contaminants of crop seed. Yellow star thistle is an example of this. Infestations of this plant reduce the amount and quality of forage for livestock and can increase threats to rare plant and animal species through degradation and fragmentation of habitat. So cheatgrass or downy brome is another invasive species that was accidentally introduced. This species was probably um, introduced to North America in soil as ballast in ships that cross the Pacific Ocean from its native range in Eurasia. It is the most widespread invader in the western US and is responsible for many negative effects on ecosystems. It creates fine fuel that causes more frequent wildfires across larger spatial scales than in the past. Repeated fires due to cheatgrass lead to loss of habitat for wildlife and this is particularly a big problem in sagebrush ecosystems, which are essential for the survival of imperiled sage-grouse species. 
Not only do we move species from where they naturally occur, we alter the environment in ways that promote their success in their new homes. We disturb the soil, which removes natural vegetation and creates conditions favorable to species that thrive with disturbance. We create corridors of disturbance that facilitate the spread of species, of seeds and propagules of invasive species by building roads and trails uh, into remote areas. Anything that makes it easier for us to get somewhere makes it easier for invasive plant species to get there too. We alter hydrologic cycles by building dams and regulating the flow of water to generate power and prevent flooding of our human infrastructure com and communities. Invasive species adapted to these uh, flows flourish, such as tamarisk or salt cedar, cedar, pictured here, while native cottonwood suffers because it needs bare soil deposited by floods at the precise time its fluffy seeds are released. We also add nutrients to the environment through our activities. Many invasive species have higher growth rates and are better suited to take advantage of high nutrient levels than native species. So gaseous emissions from vehicles and industry add nutrients to the environment too. These emissions contain greenhouse gases that contribute to climate change and boat drink and both of these can favor invasive over native plants. So what's the difference? All of these changes promote generalist species that are tolerant of a wide range of environmental conditions, and native species with particular requirements often struggle under these circumstances, which leads to loss of biodiversity and homogenization of the biota. Invasive plants are an important way that humans change the world. They are a global change. Thanks. All right, um, two more. Next, oh, there she is, Dr. Melinda Smith, who is faculty in the biology department, and she will be speaking on a problem of scale, why species diversity does not matter. Woo! <laughs> Sorry. Um, just a second before you start. Uh, those people in Ecology 600, raise your hands. Come on, let's see. A's. No, I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> no, okay. I think I'm ready. Okay. So I'm really excited to be here to talk to you about something I think about a lot. Um, when I'm doing climate change experiments, I think about how do we extrapolate what we learn from these experiments to the broader scale, and do, does species diversity matter when we're doing that extrapolation? So a few caveats. Um, I'm a plant community ecosystem ecologist. I focus on a single trophic level often, and I work in grasslands. Um, and in particular, I'm going to talk about tall grass prairie. So just think about this as my worldview as I impose my perspective on you. So this is what I do. I put out plots. I measure them for community composition, productivity. I do that at multiple plots in my experiments. And then I try to understand the impacts of global change, such as climate change and other factors. So the question is, you know, how do we extrapolate these pretty small scale experiments to the big context, right? And that's a big question because we want to predict responses of these systems to uh, global changes. But when I ask that question, I ask another question, and that's whether diversity matters when we're scaling ecosystem functioning. And so when we're talking about diversity, I'm, I'm going to talk about two elements. One is the number of species. The other is relative species abundances. And I'm going to talk about the first one first. All right, so there's a lot of evidence that richness does enhance ecosystem functioning. So here's Cedar Creek, uh, tall grass prairie, showing uh, increased functioning and even larger effects of richness than other global change factors. So maybe it does, uh, uh, it, maybe it is important for scaling. And there's a whole slew of papers that suggest that richness enhances ecosystem functioning. You can see they're all in these beautiful high impact journals. Um, but none of these, uh, actually talk about relative species abundances. And this is really important because a fundamental pattern in ecology is that there's a few common species in many communities and a whole bunch of rare species. Okay, so species vary in their abundances. This is a pattern that's long been recognized. Darwin, he was really interested in the rare part of the, the, uh, the rank abundance curve. 
Gaston, he, was, he recognized how these common species are often overlooked, even though they're so important. And Hutchinson thought it was a mystery because he's cool. He can do that. Um, so if we think about commonality, dominant species are actually a special case. You know, you think about common species being of high abundance and widespread. Dominant species are expected to have large impacts on the system. And so these dominant species, this concept of dominance is not new to ecology. It's really old. And if we think about the mass ratio hypothesis, it predicts that if you remove a dominant species, you should see a large impact on functioning. And our meta-analysis shows that that's the case. And if you dig a little deeper and you go into the system I love, near and dear to my heart, you see that species vary in their abundances. Andropogon girardii is the most abundant. You reduce abundance of this species, and you get a concomitant de uh, decrease in productivity. Big impact of this dominant species. So you may be asking, what about all those other species? Look at them all. They're all sitting there. Well, that's a good question, because there's a lot of papers that suggest those species are important for functioning. And I just said one species might be important for functioning. So if we think about those other papers, right, those other studies, they off, almost entirely, all of them, mimic random loss of species, meaning that you could lose a dominant species just as, as uh, likely as losing a rare species. But that's probably not the case in real systems. Most of the time, we, uh, species are probably lost non-randomly. And all else being equal, if you go by abundance, rare species spe should be lost first. Common species should be rarely lost, or these dominant species rarely lost. And so that's really important to think about. So what happens if you actually do non-random loss, impose that on the system? And we did that in tall grass, grass, tall grass prairie. We imposed a fourfold loss of species going up the rank abundance curve, no effect on functioning. So what's the answer? Dominant species rule, obviously, right? <laughs> that's what I say. Um, and so, so that's cool. You know, we could stop there, right? But um, what does this have to do with scaling, you may be asking yourself, because that's kind of what I started my talk with, right? Well, I would argue it has everything to do with scaling, right? We can link hierarchically from the individual to the ecosystem level with dominant species. We can go across spatial scales. We can go from the, the plot scale to the regional scale with dominant species. But that does raise a question. Why are these species dominant? What, what are the mechanisms of dominance? And what's really cool is like 5% of grasses, only 5% of them are dominant. And even, um, even within clades, dominant species are non-randomly distributed. So I would argue diversity, i.e. richness, does not matter for scaling. What we need to know is why are species dominant? How will they be affected by global change? And who will be the next dominant species? So maybe d diversity does matter. Thank you. OK. For our last talk of the night, we have a little bit of a curveball here. We actually have a team of speakers. Um, it is a um, global challenges research team, and I will let them tell you a little bit about themselves. Their title or their name is the Crisis in Creativity Global Challenges Research Team. And the title of their talk, I'm stalling for them so they can all grab microphones, um, is called Thinning of Species. All right, thanks so much, Jacob. Thanks to all of you for sticking around to the end to see this. And most importantly, thanks to Mindy for the best introduction I could have imagined. You saved me about three minutes. <laughs> so we are uh, a uh, SOGIS funded uh, global challenge research team. Uh, and uh, we're a collaboration of uh, poets and ecologists. And um, what we were interested in is, um, well, first, let me just say our members, because we're not all here tonight. So uh, Cedar Brandt, Felicia Zamora, Maria Fernandez Jimenez, um, and Ken Losi also contributed uh, to this work tonight. We have up here on stage Rico Moore, uh, Dan Beachy Quick, uh, Stuart Breck, and Chris Schell. And we have a special uh, guest member tonight on keys, Devin O'Dell. So um, what we're interested in is um, the effect of uh, biodiversity loss. It's hard, hard to feel. It's hard to touch. It's hard to interact with. You know, I, I was thinking about it today. Um, 
probably none of us or very few of us have experienced species loss. There's not a species that was common to us in our childhood that is no longer on the planet. In our current profession, many of the ecologists are aware of this, but I would say the average individual hasn't personally experienced species loss. We have all probably experienced loss. I lost a nephew last year, it was extremely uh, difficult and painful. Many of us have lost parents or grandparents. And the gap between those two things, they're, 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 they seem similar in some ways, but there's a gap there. So what we did is we asked, how can you translate biodiversity loss onto text, onto an image, onto a piece of music? Um, and what we, what we came up with was that we could translate pretty much anything into a rank abundance curve. And then we can remove the most rare species first. Uh, in this case, uh, we have an image that will be lost during the course of the presentation. Each pixel is an individual, each shade is a species. We have a piece of music that will go through five iterations. Each note, uh, including different notes, same notes, different octaves, are lost from rarest to most common. And uh, a reading of um, the opening part of Genesis, where we remove the, the least common word first and are left only with the most abundant word. And so what I invite you to do while we do this uh, the, uh, uh, is to sit with us and try to experience this, try to feel it, try to feel what's happening today due to species loss and, and see if we can get that in, across. And finally, I just want to dedicate um, this talk to Jean uh, Calment. She uh, died 30 years ago and lived to be 120 years old. And the vast majority of species that are extinction ensemble is going to read, died during her lifetime. The remaining few that will come at the end has died during our lifetime. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth, and the earth was without form and void and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. And God saw the light, that it was good. And God divided the light from the darkness. And God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And the evening and the morning were the first day. And God said, that there be a firmament in the midst of the waters, and let it divide the waters from the waters. And God made the firmament, and divided the waters which were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament, and it was so. And God called the firmament heaven, and the evening and the morning were the second day. And God said, let the waters under the heaven be gathered together unto one place, and let the dry land appear. And it was so, and God called the dry land earth, and the gathering together of the waters called he seas, and God saw that it was good. The Amsterdam duck, God, Himalayan quail, the heaven and the Labrador duck, and Macarena the rail, was Marshall Islands and the warbler, and St. Lucie giant rice was the Seychelles parakeet, of the Namoy grass and red the of Eastern God, hair, wallaby, the bone and of the waters, hero, and God said, pigeon, "Let there emerald, light." Humid macaw, and there was light, Delandes and God, Kua, the light, Yvonne Crimson, it was, crown fruit dove, and God, Gould's the emerald, light from the Guadalupe and God called Guadalupe the light, burrowing owl, and the Hawaiian called, whale, and the Jamaican poor whale, and the Jamaican unicorn and the, the God said, "Let there Mangarine from a mint." The Mangareven Whistler, the waters, Marianne and let it, Eye, the waters Ren, from the waters, New Zealand Little and Bitter, God, the North firmament, Island Little Spotted and Kiwi, the waters Nukupu, were the firmament, Puerto the Rican waters Carnour, were Raul the Island firmament, rail, and it was Red Crowned Parakeet, and God called the Ryuku firmament King heaven, Fisher, and the Tristan Moran, and the Lesser Coa were Finch, the Saint Vincent and God Pugliado, said, Let the waters, Maui Nui Akioloa. Seeming and let the Kona grows was and Lyle God called the shantail hopping mouse of the waters, greater called, Koa Finch and God Nelson's rice rat. It was Bewick's wren, Hawaii Momo, 
Puerto Rican Hushia, Antigua Burring Owl, Antioquia Brush French, Mogado Pinot, Tukurti, and Borneo Balloon, Chatham Fern Bird, and Borio Chatham Rail, Coos Guadalupe Spotted Turkeys, Wahina Polynesian Warbler, Ruaskakipa, West Coast Spotted Kiwi, Long tailed puppy mouse, cuckoo shrike, Assumption Island cuckoo, dark throat, Assumption white throated rail, Greater Amalekihi, Desmarest Pilari, New Zealand Morganser, Two Sub Crestes, Bulldog Rat, McLaren's Rat, Guadalupe Karakara, Bar Belly Cuckoo Shriek, Dark throated Oriole, Woodpecker, Black Mamo, Samoan Wood Rail, Alejandro Silkirk Fire Crown, Juan Fernandez Fire Crown, Cebu Bar Belly Cuckoo Shriek, Challenger's Lord, Chatham Bellbird, Chaniho Chat, Choice Sewer Pigeon, Calibra Amazon, Guadalupe Flicker, Guadalupe Storm Petrel, Huya, Large Tailed Grass Wren, Lasian Miller Bird, Lower House Rush, Madeiran Wood Pigeon, Mari Thrush, Moloka Eo, Moho Basurbi, New Caledonia, Pigeon Button White, Norfolk Caroo, Oahu Akialoa, Slender Billed Brackle, Western Grass Run Subspecies, Spearing Cackling Goose, Laughing Owl, Passenger Pigeon, Lana Hookbill, Lord Howe White Eye, Glaucus Macaw, Javen Buffum, Turquoise Throated Puffleg, Virgin Island Screech Owl, the West Paradise Bear, Blazing Honey Creeper, Wise Star, Lord Howe Phantom, Antimon Gazelle, Russian Pike Curlwound, Caribbean Darwin's Galapagos Mouse, Gold's Mouse, Boring White Owl, Caroline the Parakeet, Hawaii Little Swan, Lord Howe Gazelle, the Yuka Wood Pigeon, St. Louis Grey, Mount Western Lewis's Rail, Pumper Wood Rad, Lester Bill Z, Aurora, Pemberton's Deer Mouse, Sweet Hockey Here Wallaby, Sean Burke's Deer, Keith Hen, Lesser Stick Nest Rat, Indefatigable. Galapagos Mouse, Desert Island Rat King, Rat King Rat 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 Tasmanian Tiger, McDonald Rose, Grass Rat, Franklin Lyle, Fighting Wars, Chubbos, and Lucas Guzan, Western Dider Grand South Irish, Hawaii, Kilo, Miss Bristle Bird, San Benito House Finch, Volcano Islands, Parrot Falcon, San Clemente, Washington. Norfolk Lawn Tail Fork, Desert Bandicoot, Tulip Wamba, Malaysian Rail, Cypress Dipper, Arabian Canada, Wake Island Rail, Pied Ray Chest, Bahia Roof, Bahia Roof, Bahia Roof, Christmas Island, Tiwi Island Hooded Robin, Anguiguan Reed Warbler, Cozumel Thrasher, Saudi Gazelle, White Rhino. What do you say? Um, let's hear it all. Let's hear it again for all of our speakers tonight.